family trapped on the second floor of their apartment captured the sea, swallowing their town. They were certain they'd die, they said. The mangled wreckage of the crash which claimed the lives of five of its occupants. And I sat down there at two o'clock in the morning, I remember writing the story, and there were teardrops falling on the keyboard. Bander Arche was so much easier to cope with than watching a young mother drag her dead baby from a river. For anybody in this business, if you're dealing with something that is shocking, that is ghastly, that is heart-wrenching, don't leave it inside you. It doesn't matter whether your involvement in news is as a journalist, a camera operator, producer or an editor, all of us will be exposed to trauma and during our careers, quite a lot of it. Now most of us deal with it fine most of the time, but we probably all have at least one story that stays with us more than others or have a cumulative effect where sometimes dealing with so much trauma can impact in our daily lives. That's what this DVD is about, recognising that when it comes to the most difficult stories, we're not bulletproof. So how do we start dealing with that? Well, the first step is to begin talking. You don't bottle up the emotion, talk about it. Peter Harvey is one of Australia's most experienced and recognised journalists, his career spanning the Vietnam War to Canberra to Lebanon. But one of his first reporting jobs still haunts him. An aircraft crashed in Botany Bay when I was a reporter on the Daily Telegraph. It would have been 1960, 1961. And um, back in those days, and maybe it still happens, but back in those days, police rounds reporters had a very close contact with people who ran the city morgue. And um, one of the morgue attendants uh, rolled out the uh, ice chests and showed me the bodies. And it's stuck in my memory ever since. I have never, ever seen anything. I had never seen anything like this. Half a dozen people pulled out of a plane wreck. And it affected me very deeply for quite some time. I didn't realise then that the way out of this problem was to talk about it, was to go back and tell people what I'd seen and how it affected me. And I should have done that. Um, these poor mangled bodies of the air hostesses and the pilots and so forth. It was a, just a terrible, terrible sight. And here was I, a kid of about 19, I think. And it really, um, it, it, I mean, to this day, when I think back, I can still see it happening. News Limited photographer Rene Noitaga says difficult though assignments in Bali and Aceh have been, her time on a local newspaper was more testing. And there was two people on the bike, the car had run into a telegraph pole and the other people were lying on the ground and they were actually still alive at that stage. But they, three or two of them died after that. And being there first on the scene was quite difficult for me to deal with. And when I actually finished the job and went back to the office, my um, news editor said, my God, you look absolutely white. But if you do car accident after car accident after car accident, after a while it sort of just keeps building up and up and up. In initially I used to probably just go back to work, debrief with a couple of my mates at the pub, get a bit drunk, go home, pass out and get up the next day and go to work. And it was the sort of thing where you weren't taught to deal with it and you hadn't really dealt with it before and there was sort of no such compassionate work, it was almost like you were just expected to move, oh, it's just a car accident, let's move on to the next thing. Many rural reporters find themselves covering the deaths of people they know. Erin Kassar was just a few months into her first full-time job as a journalist in Mildura when she had to cover a car crash in which six teenagers died. She knew some of the families. It was basically a complete chaos. Um, then I'd had another phone call saying that there were hundreds of people gathering at the Muldura Base Hospital and um, I called my cameraman again and said I really think we need to go out there and we did and um, the scene was just unlike anything you've ever seen before, just mobile phones ringing, people running around asking kids and parents if they'd seen their child because they knew they were at that party and it was just mayhem. I remember speaking to my mum that night and I said to her, I'm so new in this job and I know I'm never going to go through anything like this ever again. I was sort of wondering, you know, why it was affecting me the way it was and I actually had a phone call from someone in the industry who was working in Melbourne and he said to me, you know, do you feel like you're getting involved? And I said, 
well, a part of me does. And he said, that's okay. He said, a lot of people will tell you it's not okay. And I said to him, well, I don't think I know how to do it any other way. As a young night police reporter, and I was 18 when I started, um, you went to every fatal, every fatal car crash. And so you saw a lot of bodies. You, you, you intruded in a, on a lot of grief. And you did get very up close and personal with the death. Um, Fairfax writer Gary Tippett. And you learn those coping mechanisms of, of cynicism and, and black humour as a sort of a protective wall for yourself. And, and you, can't be, you can't be a real good journalist if you're apart from what you're writing about. If you have that cynicism and that, that barrier, then, then you, you can't be empathetic. What many in the industry call death knocks, Gary calls intrusions. And they can be difficult for the families and the journalist who approaches them. And, and the car crashed. Two boys in the back seat were killed. The car split in half. And we decided to follow the story, and part of the story was to do the intrusion. Bad luck, bad timing, stupidity. I turned up at the door of these people on the day of the funeral, and they were having the wake. And, you know, I, I, I got my courage up, and I walked up to the first person that I saw, and I, I introduced myself and said I, I, I wanted to talk to him, and it turned out to be the father. He thought about it for a while, and he said, yeah, I'll do it because... I want to tell people what it's like, exactly what it's like, to have that knock on the door. And I went back to work and I sat down there at two o'clock in the morning, I remember writing the story, and there were teardrops falling on the keyboard. I was listening to him talk on the tape and it moved me uh, incredibly. And the thing that I thought about in the end was I'd done hundreds of intrusions like this and I'd never written a story about what it was like for those people to have that news. And every single one of those intrusions was the same story or something similar, that ripple effect of loss. We sometimes can go in and um, ignore or forget in our rush to get a deadline or, or, or to beat the competition. Um, we forget that these human beings that we're dealing with are suffering the worst trauma of their lives. Terrorists bought people up, put them up against this wall and shot them. And after they did Sometimes that, that trauma disaster. remains with us, as ABC journalist Phil Williams learned. Beslan was for me uh, so horrific because it had two elements. Uh, it involved children, and I'm a father, and uh, I think there's a special significance when you're a parent. You, 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 you really uh, are appalled by any sense of cruelty to any children. It's a universal sort of reaction. And the other element of it was that there was personal danger, that there was a lot of gunfire, the mortifier. Uh, we were scared. There's still the blood here from where they were thrown over, somebody's shoes there. It just beggars belief. I mean, how these people could have possibly thought that their cause would be enhanced by murdering these people and murdering not just adults, but children inside a school. It affected me at the time and there was a delayed reaction. But even, even up to a year later, uh, my family would tell me that I was quite different. I was angry. Um, I wasn't my cheerful self. I was snappy with them. Definitely changed. And I remember one particular incident One incident with my daughter when I was sitting at a computer at home <clears throat> and she came up behind me, a 12-year-old girl, and just playfully grabbed me from behind and went, boo. And I just grabbed her hand and just yelled at her. I said, don't ever do that again. Really just screamed it at her, completely out of character. She was shocked. She ran upstairs and was so frightened she just hid under the blankets of a bed. And I knew that I'd stepped over a line there, that, that this had really affected me, you know, more than I had, had thought. You know, the smell of um, dead bodies didn't take long, you know. 
we were there a couple of days after it happened and, and in fact when we landed at the airport you could smell it and the airport from the town is you know 10 or 12 k's out of town and you could you could smell it, it was putrid and the first night we were there there was you know two or three in the morning there's massive aftershock and the staying in the governor's residence the chandelier just started shaking everyone woke up screaming running out so the pressure during major assignments like the boxing day tsunami can be relentless and Channel 7 cameraman Rob Brown says sometimes it's loved ones who bear the brunt of that. Yeah, I, I, I tend to find I'm a little bit short with certainly my wife because, um, I don't know, limited time, she always tells it, says I'm talking too fast, can you slow down, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just the amount of stress that you're under at the time to, to try and get everything completed within the day and, and planning for the next day. And uh, yeah, normally, you know, my wife bears the brunt of uh, any of my frustrations. So, yeah, it's not much fun for her. It was the aftershocks that woke me up. Still, when I got home, I had nightmares for t 10 days to two weeks. Um, and I woke up trying to claw my way out through the bedroom wall. And yeah, it was something that kind of stayed with me for a while. But Rob's colleague, Jess Adamson, says difficult though Arche was, the story that's troubled her the most happened right outside her newsroom on Adelaide's Torrens River. We warn viewers our report contains scenes that may cause distress. The alarm was raised just before nine this morning. And she was screaming and saying that her child had been abducted, her uh, six-month-old baby boy who she'd been pushing in a stroller had been abducted. ...had been pulled from the river, still strapped in his stroller. His mother watched in horror as officers tried to save her baby boy. And the cameraman did his job and filmed and um, I just, I, I called an ambulance and we did what we could but I still to this day feel guilty for being a journalist at that moment and, and not a trained paramedic. It was every parent's worst nightmare. Leonardo died in hospital six hours later. And so that day I just went on and did the story and to be honest that was the best thing for me that day. But at one minute past six, I completely just lost it and just broke down and in tears and it, it took its toll. Um, and I'd kind of be worried, I would be worried if it hadn't. I got some fairly vicious hate mail in the days that followed. People that emailed and um, wrote things like, I should never ever have children and they hoped that I would never ever be lucky enough to have children of my own if I was able to to be, able to be there and report on such a story. Um, and that kind of was pretty tough. People have this misconception that journalists don't have feelings and that was just completely highlighted. They obviously thought that I just couldn't have cared two hoots about what happened and that what a scoop Channel 7 had got by being there. And I'd give anything not to have been there that day. Coping with what we see and experience can be the hardest part of the job. It can be a shock to those just starting out in news, but the cumulative dangers are just as great for experienced hands. Every bad thing you see, every crook job you go on, works on you like, I believe, works on you like Chinese water torture, drip by drip by drip. It, it can do you harm. I find going home, if, if I feel overwhelmed by something or if I feel quite upset by something, going home for me and just having some space and having my own time to, to think about it and get over it and then I feel like I have moved on. It, it took me a long time to learn that you, in this business you have to wear, it's not cynicism so much, but you have to wear a, a, a mental protection like an overcoat. You have to be able to put this overcoat on and take it off when, when that's appropriate. But above all, don't bottle these things up. When you see something that is shocking, when you deal with tragedy, when you find yourself torn in part by fear and emotion, what have you, talk to somebody. Talk to somebody. People quite often say to me, how do I feel when I go to a war zone, when it was Vietnam or the Gulf War or the Hezbollah War last year? I tell them, I feel frightened. TUE's program director, Greg Burns, understands how trauma can affect his staff. As a radio reporter, he covered events such as the first Bali bombing. Big stories, 
um, tend to involve um, the loss of human life. So for a young journalist to, to earn their stripes on a big story, it's, they're going to be surrounded with pretty traumatic um, images and they feel obliged and gung-ho and, and to get in there and do it. But there is a time when you're then on your own and it hits home. It might be seeing it on a TV screen. For a radio reporter, it might be sitting there watching the TV. Um, and everyone is affected differently by that. And I think for the young guys, particularly, uh, they need to know that they are going to be affected, um, uh, not necessarily in a bad way, but it will have some sort of effect on you. And as managers, we need to take that into account and make sure that those support systems are in place. Uh, we had a reporter in Bali who stuck his hand up after two days and said, get me out of here. Now, we initially thought, he'll be all right. Um, and then, then an hour later or two or three phone calls later, having spoken to that same journalist, you know that, no, he's not all right and we need to get him out. And we did. If you feel that you can't tell any of your colleagues because you're worried about how they're going to feel about you, it, don't worry about that because they'll almost certainly have exactly the same emotion as you and will probably respond quite gratefully if you do broach the subject. And uh, it, it, it helps to close the hole in your soul. And to learn how to talk about them, how to deal with them. And if you work in a, in a newsroom where everybody understands that, then you're much safer. So I think it's really important that we get our senior people to acknowledge that a bad things happen and that we are human and that we're vulnerable, just as vulnerable as any other member of the community and, uh, and that we should take it seriously because otherwise we're sort of setting ourselves apart aren't we? We're, so, we're sort of saying actually being a journalist somehow magically makes you bulletproof and it doesn't.